you believe that I had anything to do with that? from a conference of Congolese leaders in Madagascar, at which it was agreed to convert the Republic into a loose confederation. The streets are jammed for a parade in celebration of the decision. But red opposition to the plan is heated, and the pro-Soviet Antoine Gazenga, Lumumba's political heir, still controls key areas and sizable armed forces. The Congo's problems are far from over. Vienna was a neutral arena for a sparring match between two worlds. The men who hold the power to write tomorrow's history met, smiled, and resolved no problems. The dictator and the president, the East and the West. St. James Church in the Hudson River hamlet of Hyde Park is the scene of last rites for the first lady of the world, Eleanor Roosevelt. President Kennedy heads the list of distinguished world leaders who pay last tribute to the extraordinary and beloved woman who is remembered as a humanitarian and one who loved her fellow man. There is no strife. No prejudice, no national conflict in outer space as yet. Its hazards are hostile to us all. Its conquest deserves the best of all mankind. And its opportunity for peaceful cooperation may never come again. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why, 35 years ago, fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. In the Cold War, the ground forces of NATO have been alert against the military threat of the communist bloc. Now, Honest John missiles add to NATO's striking power. President Kennedy begins a tour of four space installations at Huntsville, Alabama, where he is greeted by Dr. Verna von Braun, space pioneer and director of this research and development center. The missiles on display are dwarfed by the mighty Saturn rocket. This booster is the first stage of the rocket that will put the three-man Apollo capsule into a two-week orbit of the Earth in 1964. Preliminary to a lunar shoot. Gemini, which was developed here, will allow two men to orbit the Earth for two weeks will be used for experiments in outer space rendezvous and docking missions. This winds up the president's first-hand look at our space program and our progress in the race for space. The first deficit comes from a recession. And if we can take the proper action in the proper time, this can be the most important step we can take to prevent another recession. That is the right kind of a tax cut, both for your family budget and the national budget. Chiang Kai-shek, leader of the peoples of free China on the island of Taiwan, heads the celebration of the 50th anniversary of the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty. 11 million Chinese, strong with their dream of someday wresting their homeland from the communists, are marking the day that saw the end of 4,000 years of monarchy in China. Khrushchev declared, through the formation of the world system of socialism, the situation in the world has altered radically. At present, it is not known who encircles whom. On December 2nd, 1961, Castro reveals, I am a Marxist-Leninist and will be one until the day I die. Socialism is a world reality today. There is no halfway between socialism and imperialism. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, will be found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back. It shall be the policy of this nation 
to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Communism's adventure in Cuba is a sophisticated one, political, psychological, subversive, with paramilitary features. Can a democratic society, wherein the right to know and the value of knowing are basic, can a democratic society wage successful political, psychological, subversive warfare against communism? Leather is falling into step in the fall fashion parade. Finished in an explosion of rainbow colors, leather has been styled into smocks and sheathed top skirts like this eye-stopping pair. Just the thing for a day's outing at Sterling Forest Gardens in New York. In Trafalgar Square, 2,000 Londoners demonstrate against the United States blockade. Fidel Castro whips up a furor in Cuba, charging the United States with arming and training mercenary forces for an imminent invasion. He calls out some 200,000 militiamen for training and guard duty at key points throughout Havana. Khrushchev happily receives a gift of the Cuban flag as he lines up with a solid endorsement for the home-brewed anti-Americanism of Fidel Castro, the Soviet sole Western Hemisphere ally. As he arrives back in Washington, the president hears more bad news. China has just invaded India. Is this part of a two-pronged communist assault? Now the president must weigh all the factors one final time, then make his decision, knowing that whatever he does, he risks nuclear war. Meanwhile, the United States continues to reinforce its Cuban base at Guantanamo Bay, the naval depot that Castro wants the U.S. to give up. These Marines have been assigned the job of protecting the base against any Cuban threats that might arise during the present crisis. Mr. President, I am submitting today a resolution to the Security Council designed to find a way out of this calamitous situation. This resolution calls as an, as an interim measure under Article 40 of the Charter for the immediate dismantling and withdrawal from Cuba of all missile and other offensive weapons. The inauguration of Abraham Lincoln as the 16th President of the United States is reenacted in the nation's capital 100 years after the event. There's a crowd larger than the original President this day, double the 10,000 of 1861. And the bright balmy day is in marked contrast to the gloomy overcast of a century ago. Scenes familiar from history books and movies come to life at the Capitol as Mr. Lincoln arrives. He is portrayed... Following is the letter which has just been dispatched from the President to Chairman Khrushchev. I think that you and I, with our heavy responsibilities for the maintenance of peace, were aware that developments were approaching a point where events could have become unmanageable. So I welcome this message and consider it an important contribution to peace. It urgently recommends that the United States and the Soviet Union confer promptly on measures to remove the existing threat to the security of the Western Hemisphere and the peace of the world, and to report thereon to the Security Council. Earlier today, Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara announced that yesterday's photographic surveillance of Cuba indicated that the bases were being dismantled. But with increased United States aid and instruction, Vietnam soldiers learn to fight back against the communist Viet Cong. Helicopters become a crucial weapon against guerrillas who strike, then disappear will-o'-the-wisp in marshes. Southeast Asia and Berlin are not the only hazard areas in the orchestrated struggle of the Cold War. There is Cuba, from which Bay of Pigs invaders hobble back when their ransom is paid. The president visits the big missile center at Vandenberg Air Force Base. 
he becomes the nation's first president to see an intercontinental ballistic missile fired when an Atlas D blasts off its pad to roar down the Pacific missile range in a perfect launch. The French army has seized Algeria in its revolt against de Gaulle. More on that later. In Laos, the government's army suffered its worst defeat of the Civil War, evacuating its last stronghold in north-central Laos. Now the communists may want to begin the ceasefire talks. And I believe that in the 1960s, the United States can once again capture the imagination of the world. Chicago, the windy city, is both windy and snowy in the wake of a storm which leaves more than half a foot. Temperatures drop to zero during the storm. San Francisco gets the heaviest snow in 30 years. Children, many of whom have never seen snow before, are more spellbound than snowbound. But they soon learn what to do with the stuff. <laughs> I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. That I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan arrives in Key West, Florida for a conference with the President on the explosive crisis in Laos. They jointly declare determination to prevent the Southeast Asian Kingdom from being taken over by communist-supported rebels. Also discussed is Britain's ceasefire proposal to Moscow. Mr. Miko, is the Soviet Union willing to agree to a ceasefire in Laos? We touched in conversation this subject. Uh, I have nothing to say publicly at this moment. The look for 61 will recall the jazz age, and where Paris leads, the rest of the fashion world is likely to follow. Here was a new symbol of communist ruthlessness. Overnight, East Berlin became a concentration camp, sealing in the inhabitants of that sector. Barbed wire and cement were the answers to the refugee problem. Khrushchev repeats his threat to sign a separate peace treaty with East Germany, which he claims, wrongly, will end all Western rights in Berlin. Served with an order by East German authorities that all U.S. personnel must show identification before entering that section of Berlin, American troops answer with the only language the Reds seem to understand, a show of arms. Castro marks the second anniversary of his revolution with the biggest military parade ever staged in Cuba, featuring tanks and other heavy weapons from Russia and Red Czechoslovakia. Shortly afterwards, Castro demanded the United States Embassy drastically reduce its staff to 11 persons. It was the last straw in his long campaign of provocation and harassment. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space. And none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. The assault has begun on the dictatorship of Fidel Castro. Cuban army pilots opened the first phase of organized revolt with bombing raids on three military bases. In Havana, 
Acting Foreign Minister Olivares shows diplomats rockets fired from the Cuban raiders, which he claims have U.S. markings. These charges are totally false, and I deny them categorically. The United States has committed no aggression against Cuba, and no offensive has been launched from Florida or from any other part of the United States. It's an honor for me, El Estaroy entre un grupo de los hombres más valientes del mundo. Castro gloated over his victory and told the world that Cuba was now a socialist nation and would hold no more elections. The next day, the United States officially proclaimed Cuba to be a communist satellite state. Man had his first great success in space when the Russians pushed a man across the threshold. He was Yuri Gagarin, the astronaut the Russians lionized as the first to orbit the Earth. It was the propaganda coup of the year. Today, this redstone mercury is the center of world attention as Lieutenant Commander Shepard walks to the elevator that will carry him 65 feet aloft to the capsule. It's 6.20 a.m., a moment of history. Three, two, one, zero. performs perfectly as it lifts the funnel-shaped capsule gracefully along. 115 miles up, he went 300 miles down range, right on target, and was picked up by waiting helicopters. <laughs> the triumph of Alan B. Shepard, U.S. space pioneer. Explosive bolts on the escape hatch let go, and the mercury is lost. However, the moon gets closer. Albany, Georgia. A Negro fight against segregation is led by the Reverend Martin Luther King. And if necessary, me, we must be willing to fill up the jails all over the state of California. Just why uh, the Soviet Union would wish to detonate a 50 megaton explosion, something about which we can all speculate. At Oxford, integration at the University of Mississippi becomes a one-man crusade. When Air Force veteran James Meredith tries to register, the police lines are drawn, U.S. Marshals blocked. When university officials are cited for contempt of federal court, Governor Ross Barnett personally Negro applicant. Meredith goes away, and the federal government ponders its next move. The forces increase tenfold and more. It is not enough to avert a night of rioting, leaving two dead and the campus the shambles of a battlefield. Seventy-five students and other rioters are arrested. Among those seized, former Major General Edwin Walker, who is charged with insurrection. And James Meredith becomes a duly registered student at the University of Mississippi. Sir, there's been a great deal of turmoil and conflict. Two people have been killed. Do you have any uh, feelings of guilt? Have you given it any second thoughts? I'm very sorry that... Uh, Anyone had to get hurt or killed. 
But of course, I think that's an unfair question to me. I don't believe any of you believe that I had anything to do with that.